All set. Hey, everybody. Welcome to On the Horizon, show three. It's Wednesday, April 22nd. Thanks for joining. Mike Lieberman, CEO at Square Two. Eric Kalis, your title, I believe, is Chief Entrepreneur in Residence these days? Just Entrepreneur in Residence. Just entrepreneur in Residence. Um, welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. And again, thanks for the excellent um, uh, response to our attempt to bring more uh, timely and relevant content to you guys on a regular basis. We certainly really appreciate it. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about content and how it's changed so dramatically in the past 30 days. And um, if we want to start with a little good news, as we've tried to do every single day, I wanted to talk just for a second about the PPP program, because I know a lot of small businesses are dealing with this. And unfortunately, I know a lot of businesses have not had a similar experience, but on the positive side, I can share the square two experience where we did have a good bank and a good banking partner that helped us get into this program. And we have been funded for the program. And the result of that is we brought four people back full time at the company. That's a pretty significant amount of people who are now not on unemployment, who are able to take care of their families, certainly for the next couple months and hopefully longer. Um, and these were people that we um, took from full time to part time. And uh, Martin, that's a US based program to help small businesses get through the next couple of months. Um, that was a comment from Martin Brendel, who I happen to know is a, a guy over in Austria who, who participates uh, with us quite frequently. So anyway, good news there for Square Two. I know not everybody has had that experience, but hopefully many more people will be uh, able to take advantage of this program going forward. So content, um, what worked last month is not going to work this month and it's not going to work for the next couple of months. When we did webinars for Square Two, when we coached our clients up on webinars, we wanted a four to six week advance start to help promote it. And you just can't simply run a webinar program four to six weeks out. You have no idea what's gonna be going on. You have no idea what the environment's gonna be or what that content should look like. So today, everything is much more real time, much more short term. And you have to start thinking about the content in the same way. You can't work on a white paper for two months and then publish it. You have to get something out quickly that's shorter format that is relevant to what people are dealing with uh, today and tomorrow and start to think about it like that. This program in and of itself is an example of how Eric and I really had to kind of think differently about how we wanted to share content with you guys as opposed to some of the things we used to do. Eric, I know you have some comments about content too. Yeah, I spend my day basically talking to entrepreneurial companies, marketing managers, CMOs, VPs of marketing, to try to help them figure out exactly what their best course of action is. And one of the things I definitely hear all the time is, I really wanna write something topical. I need to add some more content to my calendars, but I don't know which way to go because of this COVID virus. And I, don't, I really don't know how to contribute at a time like this. So I'll give you a quick example. I've already been on the call this morning with an entrepreneur who runs a software company. And the software company basically helps folks um, who sell nursing home and assisted living facilities to new families who want to have a family member there. Well, all of them are on lockdown and there's no way to get someone for a tour to decide whether or not they should select that facility. So they pivoted on a dime. They created a, a video demo where they can now take people and give them a virtual tour. And they set up a remote sales process so that families don't have to come in, but can still get 98% of the flavor of what it's like to have a family member live at their facilities. Amazing amount of content in a short period of time, once again, just matching up. And those three problems are, you know, what everybody's experiencing. You know, some of the things that people used to say are a bit tone deaf now. And what can they do to contribute? So in today's On the Horizon episode, we want to kind of drill down into what content strategies might be appropriate for our listeners. Yeah, so I've noticed two different kinds of content. I've noticed content that is 100% COVID driven. And to Eric's point, I think there's plenty of that in the market. Um, I don't know how much of that I can continue to digest. And I've noticed some content that is really like, looks like stuff that had been planned a couple of months ago that they're rolling out anyway, which I also find to be a little uh, out of whack with what people are generally thinking about and what people are generally looking for. So I think you wanna find that balance where it can be timely and relevant without being so dramatically over the top about COVID and everything that we're all honestly inundated with on a, on a regular basis. Um, to give you a good example, we're about to publish a pretty detailed 
uh, ebook playbook on how to do videos at home. So video it can, has never been more important today. And you can't work with a production company. Like Eric and I were kind of bantering before the session this morning. We actually had a production company in our office before the work from home order came down and they're now working on that content to produce some videos for us, but we could never do that again today. And I don't know when we're gonna be able to do that. That is not social distancing. There were, there were probably six people in our office. All of our team was in the office and I don't know when we would be able to do something like that again. So you have to do video at home, but how do you do that? There are some extra complications associated with that. Um, this is an example of kind of a, a virtual video session, but you know, if you want to script something, if you want to do some editing, if you want to add some graphics to it and produce a more professional video, there are ways to do it at home if you think differently about it. And I think that's where businesses need to start thinking, how can I collect the footage with my iPhone? Because by the way, you can do that. Th those phones are excellent at collecting video these days. You can remotely capture that content. You can remotely share that with a producer who can pick up that footage and edit it and get it back to you in a way that you can have a very professional video without ever leaving your home. So I think that is a kind of a mechanical and a production way you have to start thinking about video content, but then you also have to think about what story you wanna tell and what you want that video to include. So uh, those are things that you have to think about more strategically. Like how does my story relate to what's going on in the world? That's a relatively, the video idea for us is relatively easy. Video is a tactic we talk to clients about frequently. Video is a tactic marketing people are embracing more aggressively and trying to produce videos. Now they're stuck at home. How do I do that? So you want to look for that alignment between what you guys do, the tools that you use in your business, and how you can help your customers, and then figure out how to tell that story in a relatively short and compelling way. That's great, Mike. I mean, that's really down to the essence of the tactics, right? Let's shift gears a little bit and talk about what you're supposed to talk about. So I have a couple of tips that I prepared to talk about content to get you thinking differently about what you can be broadcasting to your target markets and the world in general. So the first thing is leverage social listening. See what your target markets are talking about. What's important to them? What pains and problems are they discussing? You'll find some gold in there that you can then turn into something you can help people with. For example, Mike talked yesterday about one of our client's tech services who typically does janitorial services for retail stores, specifically supermarkets and big box chains. And all of a sudden, all of their customers were talking about sanitization, which helped them really develop their own uh, aggressive sanitization program, which they now rolled out. So the first thing is take some time, uh, push it down to your team. Let's read the tea leaves and see what people are talking about so that we can assist in the conversation. Number two. You can assume a strategy of a specialized content hub. So for example, I have a very good friend, Ami Kassar. He's running a company called Multifunding. They do SBA lending. All of a sudden, he's in the limelight because of the PPP program and the CARES Act in general. He immediately created content around this and, be, and, and created a hub on his website for every question you possibly want answered about this scenario. So think about how you could put together content and help people answer questions that'll also get some nice uh, referrals and buzz, drive more traffic to your website and position you as a thought leader. And as my last tip and things I've been seeing more and more often, I, I want you to consider to surprise and delight your customers because this is a dark time for a lot of people. And when companies can have a uh, uh, unexpected surprise and delight, all of a sudden people start talking. And I prepared a couple of examples that I think will get you thinking about what you might be able to do at your company. The first one is Disney. I don't know if you guys noticed this, but over this past weekend, they announced that uh, Frozen 2 would be released early onto their Disney uh, platform. Why? Because they know that parents are at home looking to occupy their kids. They know that it's just a matter of, uh, of a calendar change for them to do that. And all of a sudden they surprise people by announcing it early. And you know, if you have little kids that those kids will be watching Frozen 2 over and over again, hopefully distracting them a little bit while you get some work done from home. Number two, Chipotle, uh, the um, uh, fast casual chain, uh, did two things. One is they announced free delivery. They understand that people are eating at home. They don't want to take advantage of that. Hey, free delivery for the month of April, which is fabulous. 
But the second thing they did is they really leaned into the Zoom happy hours, Zoom meetings, Zoom office stuff. And they said, uh, they put together a whole calendar of things where they're sponsoring these kinds of hangouts and get-togethers. So of course the theory is order your Chipotle, let's all sit around while we're eating it and have some kind of social interaction. So they're really leaning into stuff they see going on and then putting their own spin on it. And the last example, which I think is just excellent, is if you've ever stayed at a Doubletree Hotel, you know one of their secret free prizes inside are the fabulous chocolate chip, chip cookies you get when you check in. Everybody always wants to know what the recipe is. Everybody's always asking them, what's the recipe, what's the recipe? People do knockoffs of the recipe. And finally this week, they did a video where they actually showed how they make the secret recipe of the Double Tree cookies. And it was 250,000 views on the first day. Well, maybe that's not such a marketing thing to drive, you know, how many people are booking hotel rooms but they were able to do a positive thing and be on the tips of the tongues of the people 250,000 times in the first day with just doing something that surprised and delighted their clients. So think along those lines of what you can do to either help, surprise, delight folks with some of your content that you're putting out there as well. Mike, anything you wanna to add to that? Yeah, well, I'll add an example that uh, Christina, who is one of our attendees this morning posted, uh, sweetfarm.org is uh, helping people who are having meetings by letting llamas, goats, and roosters attend their meeting to lighten the mood. So obviously if we were having this meeting and we wanted to have a farm animal attend, just to give you guys a little chuckle, sweetfarm.org is the company to go to. So I think that's a really cute idea of how they're looking at what assets they have and trying to help people uh, have a more productive meeting. I wanted to talk a little bit about producing this content because obviously we produce a lot of content for clients. And you, you have to do that very efficiently, um, especially today when maybe you might not have access to all the resources you had a couple of months ago or a couple of weeks ago even. We practice this concept called hub and spoke. And what hub and spoke allows us to do for our clients is, is produce content that kind of nests in itself. So for instance, if we did a 20 page ebook, that 20 page ebook might be the top 10 ways to shoot video at home for your company, right? Each of those 10 items can then become a blog article. So while we've written the 20 page ebook, at the same time, we've in essence written 10 blog articles. Every time we post those 10 blog articles, the call to action at the bottom of the blog is a CTA to the big ebook. So now we've connected our, our long form content strategy, which is the ebook, to some shorter form content strategy, which is, which is the blog, and, and uh, attempted to be, use those two tools together to drive leads. The next thing we're gonna do is take some of the elements of the blog article, and I call that micro content and conversation starters, and use that on social media. So with each of those blog articles, I could get two or three little conversation starters that I could use on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter with links back to that blog article, which would obviously bring people to the blog article and then show them that there's a longer form piece of content also. So literally in one effort, I've created content for many different platforms and I've connected that content together in a really nice and efficient way from a production perspective. And all that takes is a little bit of thought and a little bit of planning up front, and you have a much more efficient content production exercise. Now, there's a couple of other things to consider before you jump in on that exercise as well. Like what keywords do I want this content to be found for? And what pages on my website is this content gonna be relevant? So putting the blog and the social media posts aside, I now have this, this nice ebook. It has to be written with SEO in mind because it's gonna live on your website. It's gonna have a landing page and that landing page can rank for certain keywords. And you wanna make sure that that piece of content gets put on the right pages of your website. So you have content for people who are early in their buyer journey, you have content for people in the middle of their buyer journey, and you have content for people at the end of their buyer journey. If you wanna really understand that buyer journey, then there's a page on our website about the cyclonic buyer journey. The easiest way to find that is just go to our website, squaretomarketing.com and go down to the footer and you'll see a, a link under resources that says the cycl cyclonic buyer journey. That explains eight stages of the buyer journey. But typically ebooks and white papers and long form content like that is early to mid stage buyer journey. 
So make sure that that offer gets on the pages of your website that are appropriate for people who are looking for that type of information. When you start to look at content like that and think about content like that, it gets a lot easier to create, it gets a lot easier to sustain, because this is something you want to do every single month. This is not something you do once and then you're done for a couple of months, especially today. You really need to look at creating content much more quickly um, and, and, and much more frequently um, in order to keep your prospects and clients engaged. The other thing we've started to do is look at shorter form content in addition to blog articles, like checklists, tip guides. These are one pagers that you can crank out in an afternoon that you could still use for a blog article or two, and you can still use for a conversation on, on uh, social media, but you can create these in a much faster, much quicker way. And there are tons of tools out there uh, today. Uh, Seros is an example, C-E-R-E-O-S, where you don't need a designer necessarily to create these really cool looking tools. So you can literally write it, put it into Seros, and it will design it for you, and you're ready to go. So there are so many more ways to efficiently create content, to create content that's cheaper, and to create content more frequently to keep your clients and prospects engaged. Eric? I, I absolutely agree. Hey, we have a couple minutes left here, and I wanted to talk about um, uh, being tone deaf, okay? Um, the reason I say that is because every business has a voice and tone to their content, and I think that it's important that you look at it objectively to make sure that you're not offending people. Uh, the example that I gave Mike earlier today was that um, I'm a big fan of, um, of uh, a certain brand, and they email me a couple times a day that I should place an order on their website, and uh, the messaging was, look great for your staycation. It's not a staycation, it's a quarantine. They didn't really think that through. And that headline maybe tainted my view of that company. So look at your voice and tone, make sure you're looking at it objectively as if you were someone who was locked down for a month and how they feel about receiving your content, just to do a final double check that voice and tone are on par. Um, we have a minute or two left and I, I just wanted to conclude on a more of a funnier note Zoom is obviously uh, very much in the news. And uh, this morning I got an email from a, uh, a colleague who said, if you need a laugh, check out Zoom fails on Twitter. So now there's a whole collection of people like, is this working? Can you hear me? My mother always looks like this, all that kind of stuff. So look at ways that you don't want to obviously be featured as a Zoom fail. And once again, think through your strategy so that it's as elegant as possible, even if you are recording it at all. Great point, Eric. Um, just to do a couple of housekeeping notes, we did Facebook Live today. So uh, show three was broadcast live on Facebook. Feel free to jump on it and share that with people. And uh, all these shows are available on demand. I usually put up the show an hour or two after the um, session is over. So on square to marketing.com backslash resources backslash on dash the dash the horizon. There's a page with all of these shows on demand and all of the upcoming shows we're planning as well. Uh, we're doing planning for these shows about two weeks out. So if you wanna see what we're gonna talk about tomorrow, the next day or next week, you can take a look at it there. Um, feel free to share, free, feel, to, uh, feel free to let other people know about it. We're looking to build a bit of an audience here. And again, we really appreciate you guys joining. We hope we left you, you left today with some good ideas, feeling good about what you're gonna to tackle today. Go out there, be safe. Do your best and really create some content that are, that's going to help some people and you'll be rewarded for it. Thanks very much. Have a good rest of your day. And awesome we'll see you all tomorrow.